My name is Emma Yandel and I'm the Curator and Collections Manager here at Chawton House. I'm going to talk you through a display called All About Emma that I recently curated with our collection. This was inspired by the latest reimagining of Jane Austen's novel Emma, the form of this year's new film adaptation. This film took a very distinctive and thoughtful aesthetic approach to depicting Emma Woodhouse. And this made me consider the ways in which the earliest visualisations of Emma as a character have reflected the information about her personality that's given to us in Austen's text. Emma is a character renowned for her slipperiness, who Austen reportedly quipped that no one but myself will much like. And the difficulty of fixing into one visual ideas that can be contradictory, such as whether Emma is charming or cruel, well-meaning or conniving, is something that the artists who have responded to her from the earliest depictions in book illustrations through to the actresses who have brought her to life on stage and screen was something I wanted to explore in this display. I'm going to highlight some of the objects that this included, hopefully reveal some of the stories about how Emma Woodhouse has been visualised over the centuries. So here we have the first edition of Emma that's in the Chawton House collection. It was one of only 2,000 copies that were produced, so it's really one of the treasures of our collection. It was published in three volumes, one novel being published across these three books, and that's what you're seeing here. I also have it open on the title page, where you can see that Austen did not sign her name to her works. She never did within her lifetime. First, she was referred to as by a lady for Sense of Sensibility, and here she's referred to only as the author of Pride and Prejudice. For my display, I have this first edition of Emma open on the first page of the first volume. One of the things that's remarkable about seeing a book in its first printed form is you get to understand what the physical and material experience would have been of its early readers. One thing you might notice is that the text size is quite large, and this is what happens when a novel is split across three volumes. So hopefully that means that you can read the opening line of Emma, in which Austen introduces her novel with a description of her heroine, Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever and rich. This is the information we're given about Emma as a character at the outset of the novel, part of which is a physical description, albeit a limited one. Austen rarely gives specific examples of what her heroines look like, but she does tend to give enough background information to allow us to build up an idea of the character. And here, Emma is firmly presented as being of high social standing and having the dual virtues of being intelligent as well as beautiful. It implies that the narrative that we're about to read will not be of Emma trying to achieve financial fortunes or high status, which she begins the novel with, the only one of Austen's heroes in her main novels to do so. But perhaps something else will be at stake. One of the readings of Emma is that it is the progression of her character, her psychological realisations that drive the narrative. And this has a bearing when we consider how such a character, where their psychological complexity is an important feature, can be visualised without overlooking or overemphasising certain features of their character. This brings us to the next edition of Emma I selected for my display, which is the first illustrated edition. This means that here you're seeing the first visualisations of Emma Woodhouse as a character given to her readers in England. This copy was published in 1833 as part of a full set of Austen's six novels. And the influence of the Victorian era that was just at the cusp of officially coming into being is very clear when we look at the way that she has been shown as a character. These two illustrations that we see are uh, engraved by an artist who worked on a lot of novels of the gothic genre and this influence of high drama and the stylized posing of the characters that's familiar from that genre clearly comes through. Now, Emma is very much being presented to her Victorian readers as a contemporary. Evidently, this is shown through the style of dress, which is not of the Regency era, but very much Victorian fashions with high puff sleeves, 
in her dress, as you can see in the close-up on the right, and her tiny waistline, as well as her hairstyle. Now what you see here is, for the title page, the illustrator has chosen to engrave the proposal scene when Mr Mike Lee reveals his love to Emma, and Emma realises that she was mistaken in thinking that it was Harriet he was in love with. This is the most conventional scene within the novel of Emma, and as such, Pickering is presenting it as a traditional romance plot by which marriage is attained at the end by the character from which the novel takes its name, Emma Woodhouse. Yet this scene, even in of itself, is much more complicated than this depiction would have us believe. The quotation attached to it is Mr Knightley saying, tell me then, have I no chance of succeeding? And his pose gesturing towards her in a very sentimental, animated manner, with her looking down demurely, is not reflective of the psychological realisations had by both characters within this scene. What we're being given is a much more typical and distinctly Victorian view of femininity and also of how a woman would re respond to a proposal. Despite being published 16 years prior, Emma is being presented as a contemporary to her readers. Now this particular copy of the Bentley edition of Emma that I've been showing you is extra special to us because it is part of a full set of the Bentley editions of Austen's novels that was once owned by the Knight family. The Knight family, for those of you unfamiliar with the story of Chawton House, are the descendants of Jane Austen's lucky brother Edward, who was inherited by Thomas Knight, and as such required to take on his surname. Now we know that these books belonged to the Knight family and indeed were here in the library at Chawton House because Jane Austen's great nephew, Montague, or Monty Knight as we refer to him, helpfully placed his book plate within them. And that's what you're seeing in a close-up on the right-hand side of the screen. Now when the book plate was rediscovered within these volumes, in 2017, we were lucky to have them generously donated to us, and as such, they've travelled back home to Chawton House, where previously they were housed many decades ago. Now, it was in the 1890s that some of the most influential illustrated editions of Austen's work came onto the market. Now, here you'll see a copy of Emma in my display, and then perhaps the most famous edition of all of Austen's novels, the so-called Peacock edition of Pride and Prejudice that was produced in 1894. Uh, I have these two novels side by side to reveal an interesting story that has allowed us to compare two chronologically very close but artistically very different depictions of Emma Woodhouse by illustrators. The Pride and Prejudice edition was illustrated by Hugh Thompson for publisher George Allen but following a falling out, he left to a rival publication house, Macmillan, leaving George Allen to appoint the female illustrator, Chris Hammond, to finish his set of novels. And it was her that illustrated this copy of Emma in my display. This means that we have been given the first known female to illustrate Austen's novels. Now, interestingly, we're able, through this spat, to compare both Thompson's rival editions and Hammond's own editions of Emma. Hammond is a particularly interesting person, not simply because she chose to publish under a unisex abbreviation of her full name Christine, perhaps to hide her gender. Now here we have two illustrations of the same scene, the proposal scene that was first illustrated by Ferdinand Pickering. On the left, we have Chris Hammond's rendering, and then on the right, Hugh Thompson's. Now, if we take a moment to look at these closely, you'll see clear similarities, but also differences. The first overriding similarity is that Emma is now firmly being placed within the Regency era in which Jane Austen lived and was writing. We see this from the outfit of Mr Knightley, from the high waistline of Emma's dress and her hairstyle. It is interesting to consider how Emma being placed within the time period that the novel is set might have affected how readers related or felt distant from her, something that would have been emphasised by such a depiction. 
the subtle cues of fashion that to us today might read as less obvious would have been very overt to readers at the end of the 19th century. Interesting now to see that despite the fact that the scene is the same, the quotations that have been illustrated are slightly different. And yet, they both focus on moments where Emma is at the centre, both in the way that she's positioned in the scene, but also in the moment of the scene itself. However, Thompson has taken a moment where Emma is animated. Mr Knightley has just, or is in the process of revealing his feelings to Emma, the quotation, he stopped to look the question, describes Mr Knightley, but it's Emma that takes centre stage in the illustration. She is the one that is in motion and turning back towards him. The psychological revelation of this scene and Emma's agency within it have been captured by Thompson. Hammond has taken a different approach. Her scene is much more romantic and sentimental. Mr Knightley and Emma walking hand in hand, their arms and heads almost creating the shape of a heart as they lean in towards each other. Mr Knightley is imploring Emma to say something or to say no, but Emma, for a rare moment in the novel, is speechless, unable to say anything. She is no longer assured of her opinion or her ability to assess situations correctly. It is another key moment of psychological revelation and change for Emma but has been presented in a very different way by Hammond. It is this opportunity to compare and contrast the ways in which illustrators have brought out certain parts of Emma's experience that Austen records in this text, which is so useful about having two very similar and chronologically close illustrations of her. Now, so far, the illustrations you've seen have been in black and white. They've either been engravings or line drawings. But at the end of the 19th century, colour printing was possible, albeit expensive. And in 1898, the same year that Chris Hammond's edition of Emma was published, so was the first edition of Austen's novel to be illustrated in full colour, as you can see here. This was published by J.M. Dent & Co. and by the illustrator C.E. Brock. What is particularly interesting about C.E. Brock as an illustrator of Emma is that he produced two different editions, about 10 years apart, which again allows us to compare two renderings of the same or very similar scenes. Now what he has done is chosen two very different artistic styles in which to create them. So on the left we have the more traditional engraving that's been colour tinted, and this was would have been very impressive to readers at the time to see such a brightly coloured full colour plate. Note how different it is to the black and white of the Chris Hammond and Hugh Thompson editions. But then 10 years later, it was possible for C.E. Brock, when returning to his illustrations for a new edition of Emma, to redo them as watercolours, which could then be produced. Now, Everything from the colouring, the gauzy, soft lighting, the shades that are used in the 1909 version versus the brighter colours in the 1898 one serve to overemphasise the sentimental nature of this scene and the romance. This is a traditional proposal scene, everything down to the choice of quotation, my dearest, most beloved Emma, and the more archaic script that has been chosen for the rendering of this. The watercolour gives a very different impression of this scene than the engraving does, emphasising how much an illustration can affect the import of a scene. So far I've discussed the first century of Emma's publication history and how illustrations have depicted certain sides of her character that are represented in Austen's text. But coming into the 20th century, saw so the first stage and then screen adaptations of Austen's novel, through which Emma Woodhouse is literally brought to life by actors. Here you see a magazine spread from the first stage adaptation of Emma that was produced in United Kingdom in 1945. It toured the country very successfully, the play written by Gordon Glenham, and arrived in the London's West End. As you can see here, Emma is depicted in a typical movie star headshot. She wasn't actually played by 
a well-known British actress at the time who had just played Queen Victoria. The images we see of her costume and of the set show how much it was important for the world of Highbury to be depicted as completely distinct and from another time from the wartime setting that the play was being produced. The Regency characteristics seem to be overemphasised and perhaps there to evoke an atmosphere more than historical accuracy. But one interesting thing about the play of Emma is that when we take a look at the text, we have stage directions which give a very clear and prescriptive view of how the writer, Glennon, wants Emma to be perceived by the audience. Her likability and charm are clearly emphasised by the first stage direction that uh, governs her entrance. Emma is described as vivacious and attractive. Her personality is assured and lovable. We're being offered Emma as a typical and particularly charming heroine. Adaptations owe no total debt of fidelity to Austen's text. And in the 1990s, there was a real heyday of adaptations of Emma, which again affords us the opportunity of comparing different interpretations of her character. Here we see two screenshots from films from 1995. One, a relatively traditional adaptation of Emma, and one, a complete transposition of the plotline into a contemporary setting. On the right, we have Gwyneth Paltrow. In the tradition of Anna Neagle in the 1945 stage show, this is a Hollywood actress playing the role of Emma Woodhouse. It is set within the Regency era, the humour of the novel and Emma's mischievous but also charming nature is emphasised. It is a relatively faithful adaptation. On the left, we have the complete opposite. This is Clueless, a film by Amy Heckling, in which the plot of Emma has been loosely transposed into the setting of a Beverly Hills high school. Emma Woodhouse is now Cher Horowitz, a spoilt and rich Beverly Hills teen. Now, Clueless itself might seem to have very little to do with the text of Emma for those who have read it closely, but actually its title does betray an anchoring in a key feature of Emma Woodhouse. The cluelessness of the title is a feature that it is revealed to Emma and to the reader that she has experienced throughout the novel. It is interesting to consider how these adaptations that are not part of the text but as supplements to it can exert a powerful role on how readers experience the works that Austen provided us with but also how those who have not read her text and first approach it through the adaptations build up an image of Emma Woodhouse. Emma has also been brought to life on the small screen in the form of television adaptation. On the left, we see Kate Beckinsale in the role of Emma Woodhouse, and on the right, the most recent adaptation with Romola Gara in the starring role. It's interesting to note, as you may have observed, that Emma tends to be brought to life by blonde-haired actresses. This is a relatively consistent choice that is shown also in the 2020 adaptation that I'll soon get to, whereas Kate Beckinsale's Emma is more in the line with the dark-haired image that we see in the Chris Hammond, Hugh Thompson, and then C.E. Brock adaptations. Of course, Austen's text doesn't specify a hair colour, but it does create a certain effect. Television adaptations have tended to be the most traditional takes on the novel, but as a product of that, perhaps ones that overlook some of the more problematic sides of Emma's character, instead emphasising her beauty and likability. So this brings us to our end point, the 2020 film adaptation of Emma that stars Anya Taylor-Joy and was directed by female director Autumn de Wilde. Here you're seeing the poster and some a publicity photo from the film. And if you haven't had a chance to watch it, I think these will give a very clear sense of the sort of experience that you'd be in for. Visually, this is Emma placed within a Regency-era world, but one with a distinctly modern twist from the lighting choices, the colours of the costumes, the over-the-top nature of both the acting and the settings, and the physical comedy that errs towards the stilted and the absurd. When discussing why they chose to make yet another adaptation of Emma, the producers talk about how relevant they find her as a character, 
and thinking that she will really resonate with young people today. But it feels as if they are having to sort of overcome the fact that this is a novel written 250 years ago, despite the fact that this is really emphasised by its aesthetic. They frequently refer to Emma Woodhouse in terms that we would expect more of a description of Cher in Clueless. She's spoken of as the queen bee on top of the high school, a young woman that enjoys engaging in gossip. And yet hearing the director, Alton de Wilde, talk about why she chose this aesthetic and this acting style for the adaptation, we do see that it comes from her very distinct take on Austen's text. The humour that she tries to bring out in the adaptation, she says, was very much a product of seeing how Austen highlighted the, as she terms it, inherent passive aggressiveness of the social rules of Regency England, feeling that this pressure to be polite was a never-ending source of physical comedy. And perhaps the best way of showing how this adaptation has a foot both in the world of the text and in the world of today is by returning to where we started, the opening line of Austen's novel and its description of Emma. Now, you'll see in the poster that the words handsome, clever and rich, Austen's first description of Emma Woodhouse, is repurposed as a tagline for the film. It's particularly clever because to those of us in the know, we see it as a quotation from the text. But to those approaching the adaptation with fresh eyes and not with an awareness of its history, it appears almost as if a dating bio for Emma Woodhouse. Therefore, at once, the poster is firmly rooted in the world that Austen gave us and also in the world that young people today experience. So there you have a whistle-stop tour through the history of the visualisation and representation of Emma Woodhouse over the last two centuries, which I hope has offered some food for thought for those of you who are familiar with the text representation of the character. I'd be very interested to know if you experienced Emma with illustrations or if seeing them now has sparked ideas or disagreements about how you feel her development as a character is captured in them. Now do share those in the comments and I hope you'll have a chance to visit Chawton House when we're able to reopen and see exhibitions and displays like this that we put on. Thank you very much.